Welcome back to SwitchCast Live. I'm your host, Doug Tabbitt, and SwitchCast is the automotive-related podcast where we are searching for the truth and the humor in the car industry. If it ain't true, it better be dang funny. Yes, we are here tonight with Tyler Sanders and Ethan Huffnagel, and with all of you. We appreciate you joining us live, and for those of you hearing us on the audio podcast not live, we appreciate you as well. Tonight, we've got a full docket. As usual, the automotive news and shenanigans just keeps happening and making awesome discussion (laughs) content for us. So we're going to try to unpack it and have some fun, some laughs, and maybe learn something along the way. Uh, Tonight, we are dangerously getting a little bit into politics, but only because it's automotive related. That is my rule. Everything we discuss on this podcast has to be somewhat tangentially automotive related so i feel like we're tiptoeing through a minefield like we can make it to the other side okay doug but we got to work together on this <laughs> we are tiptoeing like through a minefield but uh we're, yes okay we're not gonna get there yet we're we're not <laughs> gonna, gonna hold lose on. everybody right off the bat let's start <laughs> let's warm it up let's warm it the up viewership has gone to zero i don't know what to tell you <laughs> oh gosh you're gonna find out who i voted for tonight <laughs> No, not really. Ethan, get the defib. Sorry. Uh. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. So uh, we like to do a market update, and we're going to do a market update with a couple cars we talked about. We dissected a Diablo Roadster listing on Bring a Trailer a couple weeks ago um, because we were more talking about, like, kind of how not to list a car for auction. And the biggest reason was that it was photographed with the picture of the engine temperature, the water temperature gauge at like 300 some odd degrees, like fully buried into the red. And that just did not bode well for the auction. Um, But it sold, it ended up selling for 270 grand. And it was not the only questionable Diablo Roadster that sold. In fact, within a day of that one on cars and bids, another yellow one, sold for a measly $153,000. I like that on Bring a Trailer. This is the default thing. This isn't this particular car, but it says, this Lamborghini Diablo got away. I'm not sure if it got away. I think we just (laughs) left it there for somebody else to deal with. Right, right. Uh, (laughs) The the yellow one was very obviously a daily driver. You might say a fixer-upper. It needs some TLC. Uh, It looked... In my eyes, so janky, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was a kit car. Um, And and it's it's probably, you could probably sink about a quarter million dollars into that to restore it properly. Uh, It looked like it had kind of the same attention and modifications given to it that, you know, a Chevy Cavalier 1998 would. Some like painted gauge clusters and stuff like that. Um, But, you know, it, it was presented honestly. We're not trying to throw shade on the seller in that instance. Uh, I I think the takeaway here is that people will often look at um, just like a graph of sales and they'll say, oh, this one sold on Bring a Trailer for 270. That one sold for 153,000. The Diablo market is down. No, it's not down. You have to actually go through and understand why these cars sold cheap. Um, People allege that the 270K Diablo probably need $100,000 in engine work the seller claimed that there was no engine damage because he shut the car off immediately after it started overheating. But like two comments before that, he also said that it had been idling for an hour during the photo shoot and that's why it overheated. So like <laughs> as if that's an excuse, like that's honestly just that's worse. <laughs> idling for an hour is dangerous. So it, it just happened to overheat. The fan stopped working at the 59th minute and you shut it down. <laughs> Yeah. You were watching that temp gauge the whole time, except when they took pictures of it. So it, it was very obvious that nobody was paying attention to the details there. Uh, and somebody's the, the winning bid was keeping in mind the investment needed. Same thing with the yellow car. And I think the other takeaway, too, is with that yellow car, right? So a lot of people think, oh, man, 153 grand. That is a cheap Diablo. And absolutely it is. If you just want a janky Diablo to look like a hero in that's a fantastic deal you can probably cheat and spend five grand a year and keep that thing moving but if you're going to fix it up properly you're likely going to be upside down because yes it is the cheapest diablo on 
the market by, well, by exactly a hundred. Twenty-seven thousand dollars because the other one is the next cheapest one to sell, but you probably put two hundred fifty grand into it, and then you're in a bad Diablo fixed up and made better for four hundred grand, and you could probably just buy a really good one for four hundred to four fifty. So, like, there's that law of diminishing returns when you buy a fixer upper car that you buy a really cheap example, it, you're probably not saving money in the long run unless you're a DIYer and you're just going to limp the thing along and drive a cheap example. So Yeah, there's a very specific niche of people that can make this work. If you've got a YouTube channel, if you want to do all the work yourself, you're in it for the experience of, of owning this. But if you actually want to own a Diablo, just get the nicest one you can afford. And maybe if this is it, maybe not. You know, I honestly think we talk about speculators and people running the market up on cars, right? Oh, this, this group ruined the market, whatever. See it on the Corvette curmudgeon pages all the time. I mean, the Corvette <laughs> club yeah, what? pages. <laughs> um, but, you know, the YouTubers might actually be responsible for driving janky examples up because they need content. And there's a lot of competition for these fixer-upper exotic YouTube channels. So you can't just go buy a cheap exotic cheap anymore because all these youtubers are making a bunch of ad revenue off yeah of so the the values of those cars are set by what's reasonable to pay for something you can continue to make money off of versus something that's a money pit right <laughs> right right yes i i would love to be able to buy all these crazy cars super cheap and have the adventure of trying to fix them but i just don't have the bankroll for that and i'm not about to start a youtube channel Hank Nobody is, wants to watch that. <laughs> you're you are on a YouTube channel. Come well, on, you are not the, technically. I am off camera. I'm only my all voice right. Is. Well, season five, Tyler is going to be on camera. Uh, sneak We've peek. got a lot of changes coming season five. We think all for the best, better, better, all for the the good, more uh, good. This is going to be definitely more good. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to work on my grammar also. Yeah. So anyway, come stick around. <laughs> But I mean, stick around now through the commercial too and everything, but also season five. Uh, Corvette Curmudgeon Hank is not here with us tonight because of the potential of it snowing. Uh, but we have a couple of things in his honor. Uh, Arun on Instagram sent us this one. Forgive me if I mispronounced your name there. Um, uh, this guy, Tommy Johnson, posted something to the Cars and Coffee South Mississippi group. It was a selfie of him giving the one finger salute with the caption, quote, Cars and Coffee show is horrible. No cash or trophies to be won. Judges don't know nothing. I shine my vet for nothing. <laughs> oh, it's got 4,000 uh, responses or reactions. I, I, I have to admit, I did not read a single reaction. I just looked at the screenshot and laughed, and I'm like, okay, this is going on the podcast. <laughs> I, but I, I feel like this has to be a parody. I, everybody knows there's no judges at Cars and Coffee. Oh, yeah. this It looks like somebody found a photo of somebody. It's slightly blurry. It's obviously a guy that looks like he'd be into Corvettes. <laughs> You know, it's people like making the jokes. I laughed. Right. It's, I don't think it's real, but right. I laughed. It's it's a very good parody, but it's almost too parody to to be real. But you never know with the Corvette guys. Anyway, I, we all got a kick out of it, and so did the internet. Uh, but the anti curmudgeon Corvette uh, was posted on Mannheim this week, and it's a 2023 Corvette Z06 with 82,000 miles on it. Whew. And is it brown? I think so. I know One somebody year old. who has a metallic brown uh, C8. It's awesome. It looks Did great. he put 82,000 miles on it last year? <laughs> Holy no. <laughs> Where did he go? I don't know, like 10 cannonball attempts? <laughs> oh We're going to find gosh. out in six months that our record was broken. <laughs> brown Z06. <laughs> the crazy thing is, though, so Carfax has almost no information on this car other than basically four reports. It sold new, it hit a deer, and then it was for sale at 82,000 miles. That's it. There's no emissions test. There's no registration. I mean, it's one year old, I guess. 
but like Gosh. no oil changes, no service at the dealer. That, I mean, that would track for a Corvette owner <laughs> yeah. not to change their oil. But. Oil's only been in the car for eight months. I don't need to change it. Right. It says <laughs> it's annual service. Yeah. I didn't make it to a year. So oh, I man. I tried to look up what it... So I, I couldn't find anything else other than the screenshot from Mannheim. But Mannheim didn't have a sale result. Um, but anyway, if anyone knows what that thing sold for, it'd be very interesting. And it, it, a lot of people were complaining, too, about the Z06's popping motors. But apparently this one did just fine with 82,000 yeah. miles. All it needs is some goopy old oil, and it'll be just fine. <laughs> Stay together. <laughs> uh, an event update or notification, I guess, um, for those of you into great car shows and or cannonball stuff, myself and Arnie Toman will be taking the fraud tourist down to Celebration Florida this weekend. Kind of a last minute thing, but if you're in the area and you want to see a bunch of supercars and movie cars and celebrities, other, I mean, present company not included, but like real celebrities, uh, but also like D-list automotive celebrities, um, we're going to have the car at the Celebration Exotic Car Festival on Saturday. So come on down for that. That's uh, going to be a really interesting event. The owner of the Countach from the Cannonball Run movie is one of the founders of this event. It's a charity event. It's really pretty crazy. Um, they have an REO Speedwagon concert on Friday night. They have a uh, some famous comedian i can't remember who it is on saturday night they have a sh uh, concour on saturday a rally on sunday track day monday tuesday like this is a big thing so the cannonball run countach will be there and the fraud taurus so that come on down sweet. for that yeah i think it's free for spectators so nice the way every show should be um Let's go to a commercial and then maybe get into some politics. <laughs> Uh-oh. All right, I'm going to read this real slow. <laughs> uh, Switchcast, as always, is brought to you by BoxCast. BoxCast is a live streaming company based in Cleveland, Ohio, and they serve broadcasters and viewers around the world. Their founders launched BoxCast back in 2013 with one purpose, to make people a part of the experience. So if you're looking to live stream your podcast, church service, car show, sporting event, wedding, or even your cannonball attempt, BoxCast is an easy and flexible live streaming platform for organizations. BoxCast is so easy that we're broadcasting this show with a phone. So head on over to switchcars.com slash BoxCast to start your free trial. And if you're just joining us, we are back here at SwitchCast. I'm your host, Doug Tabbitt, here with Tyler Sanders and our producer and comment screener, Ethan Huffnagel. Uh, that's right. If you have any comments or questions, throw them in the flow of wherever you're watching live, and we'll do our best to get to the best or highest paying ones throughout the night. And we do have our question of the week coming up as well. And if you like our podcast, or even if you don't, please leave us a five-star review uh, like it, share it, subscribe wherever you are listening or watching. Feel free to download the audio podcast. We're on all major audio platforms, and uh, that helps us out with the algorithm. algorithms. It helps more people see our podcast. We've been growing like crazy, and we are very appreciative of you for making that happen because we do not do any marketing per se at all. Uh, it's all organic, so we, we love and appreciate that uh, you love and appreciate us enough to, to share it. So please continue to do that. Um, before we get into the main topic of the night, I um, let's let's or, or maybe we should go should go there and then we'll we'll come back out of it with on a lighter note. How about that? <laughs> I like we've, the sound of that. We've got an internal uh, SwitchCast caption contest here uh, that we're going to get to a little bit later, uh, having to do with a, a Mustang hearse, but uh, we'll, we'll set that up. But what I wanted to talk about this week, we're going to tread lightly here. Uh, I found an article uh, this week on NBC4i.com talking about a Columbus, Ohio program that connects residents with free car repairs. Now, this program has been around since 2020, and it is receiving a half million dollar boost in its fourth year. Let's get into this program a little bit. So it provides free repairs on taillights, headlights, turn signals, and other small issues to low-income Columbus residents. 
Uh, they define low income as 200% of the federal poverty level. So for example, I believe a uh, two-person family, however you define that, two-person family, the poverty level is $20,000. So if you make $40,000 or less as a two-person household, you would qualify for free car repairs. And it scales up depending on how many people are in your family, up to like $65,000, I think, would be the 200% mark for um, somebody with a five-person family. Um, so city council voted uh, last Monday or two weeks ago to invest $500,000 into the program's continuation. Uh, there is essentially two authorized repair shops that are uh, vetted by this program in order to do the repairs. It looks like a Honda dealership, Lindsay Honda, and Mr. Transmission slash Milex Complete Auto Care. Um, and one of the main driving forces of this program is, uh, according to the city attorney, Zach Klein, Quote, this started as an idea about how we can eliminate unnecessary police interactions and what better police interaction than a traffic stop that's really driven by poverty. These are folks who don't have operable taillights or headlights. So the reason they're getting pulled over is a violation of law because they don't have the money to fix it. End quote. Uh, they note the program has helped 302 residents since its launch in 2020 with a majority of participating resi residents being black and female. Now, why do they have to go into that? Yeah, I'm not sure why that matters, truthfully. I, I, I'm, I'm going to pause briefly here and then move on because I don't want to make it about this, but I feel like they have made it about this. If they want people to stop being racist and sexist stop making government programs about race and sex yeah i i was reading some of the same stuff you were and it just doesn't like as a statistic i guess cool if you're like into data or whatever like some report but that didn't really that's not necessarily for public consumption well, I wouldn't talking think. about statistics and data at, at no point at least in these articles and the legislation that i found have they given us statistics and data on how this is like reducing crime or reducing traffic stops or anything like that it's it's their idea is that it's reducing unnecessary police interactions but you know i talked to a cop this afternoon about this whole thing and i was like what is this and he goes it's a bunch of bs like let's just think about it logically for a second columbus city police like cleveland city police are so friggin busy they are not they don't have time to stop people for taillights out. Like that's just, that's not a thing. This is, this is a, it's posturing. It's he, he basically said like, it's a bunch of like woke BS that they're just, they're, they're projecting this idea that they're helping, but they're not really doing anything right now. I, I want to back up before, before I make this way too political, I love this idea. I do love this idea, and I've heard it from other people before. I've heard it from my friend Frank, who runs King's Auto Service. His idea was to do it as a ministry through his company to people who are in need. I've heard it from a friend and listener of ours, Coach Connie. She has thought about doing a charitable organization for single women who need help with car repairs, more as a, a bent of like not all women are stereotypically car inclined and there's the kind of assumption that a lot of car repair shops will take advantage of women by selling them stuff that they don't need because it's like well it's an easy target you know you don't understand cars so i'm gonna yeah. upsell you big time right and i think those are very very noble ideas my problem with this is that it's the government doing it the reason I have a problem with the government doing it is here's why. Here's why. Since its launch, the average cost for repairs under Project Taillight has been around $1,600. 
We're talking headlights, taillights, and other minor repairs. Now the investment cap or max per vehicle has been set at $3,200. I daily drive a Porsche and it doesn't cost me $3,200 a year. Well, and I think from everything I've found, uh, I don't know if you found anything different. This is specifically around the the lights, headlights, taillights, uh, license plate lights, uh, some safety inspection tasks, and like topping off of fluids. But no, but it's while you're in there stuff too. That's oh. the thing. They're covering other repairs that I these see. automotive shops find. So I found some legislation from the, the second year of this. And they had already run out of money. Um, the The contract with Mr. Transmission uh, had a $23,000 contract. And they declared an emergency to ensure services continue uninterrupted through the agreed upon project period and requested a $15,000 modification. A state or whatever. De- they declared an emergency, a governmental emergency to get more money for people to fix their cars. This is the problem with government is they have this, they think what they're doing is so important that they can just, uh, I'm going to wield my power. This is an emergency. No, it's freaking not. It's a car repair. Um, here's another problem with the government doing it. Uh, let's see. Where is this? This contract modification is funded through a 2021 Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, comma, Bureau of Justice Citizens, comma, Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Subaward from Franklin, Franklin County Board of Commissioners, Office of Justice Policy and Programs. There's all these friggin' governmental organizations in this. They're probably costing the city more money for the people managing this dang legislation then you could just like a good charitable organization could just pay for this to be done and do it efficiently how do you even fit all those names on a check is it one of those big like comic checks that they give to these uh, shops when they they get they get the money uh in unrelated no okay so the investment cap or max per vehicle has been set at thirty two hundred dollars in Uh, potentially unrelated news, I looked up the average cost, annual repair cost for a Nissan Altima, and it's $483. I I was wondering how we got to this much money, unless they're replacing entire headlights and entire taillights. But even then, like on our... Uh, on on like my 911, I think the headlight's like $2,500, which obviously I don't want to... This is an obscene amount of money. You could buy a used one. Yeah. You read you oh. ready? You ready? This is this is why I don't like government doing it. You know how we got to this amount of money? Is it any time you have quote unquote government money, which is not government money, it's taxpayer money. Let's be clear about that, even though the articles written about this made it seem like it was the city's money. No, it's the the city residents' money being moved around to other people. Um whenever you have government money being handed out. And I, I don't want to allege anything about the, the two shops that are that have these contracts, but this is just how government works. When you have government money being handed out, costs burgeon. Look at the cost of health care. Look at the cost of um, uh, uh, school, education, higher education, college. Oh, gosh. Look at the student yeah. loan crisis. Look at the cost of education. It has vastly outpaced inflation. I think 7% a year for the past few decades, increase in cost. Why? Because it's unlimited guaranteed government money. So you do the same thing with car repairs and all of a sudden it's, oh man, we got to buy a brand new part, not a used part. I guarantee you there's not a person in this legislation and in these uh, uh, government departments overseeing this that have anything, any knowledge about cars that are reviewing the repair bills to say, oh man, this, this is way inflated, right? A good, small, efficient, charitable organization would be going, all right, let's see where we can find used parts or can we fix this with duct tape, right? Yeah. Or if a a repair shop is doing this out of charity, like they're going to do a good fix as efficiently as they can because it's coming out of their pocket and newsflash 
If the government isn't taking this money out of our taxes, then there's more money for charitable organizations and for businesses to do these kind of things. But I guarantee you for every $3,200 per janky car, with all due respect, if you're like, if you're making 20 grand a year, you shouldn't be driving a car that's worth more than $3,200. That's what I drove when I was broke. I drove a $2,000 Saturn, and I also drove a $2,000 Toyota Matrix. So my wife said, careful when you talk about this because you're a little bit out of touch. I recognize that. But that doesn't mean I haven't been there. I've been there. I've been broke. I have lived off of $1,500 a month for everything. Rent, car repair, insurance, food, everything. I know what it's like to be there, and I figured it out. $3,200 a year is freaking insane. And I guarantee you that that's costing the taxpayers double that because of the inefficiency of government to be able to manage this friggin' program. They could just buy them cars for that amount. Can you even get <sighs> a car for $3,200 anymore? <laughs> I'm, I'm sweating. I'm taking <laughs> off my sweater. Doug's getting a little intense. No, I think... It kind of, you said something earlier that you like this idea, and I, on the surface, do as well because I think, you know, it's very easy to be in the position where where you're talking about where a a, a significant car repair can break you. It can like cause extreme financial difficulty. Absolutely. Like, and you know, it's obviously no place that someone should be in where they need to financially strain themselves to just be able to get to the places they need to go. Um, I'd almost rather wish that in a city they would focus more on infrastructure for public transportation or other things. Now, granted, I will acknowledge $500,000 towards infrastructure is probably not that much. <laughs> no. Things are expensive. <laughs> but uh, you make a good point, though, because the same justification is given towards public transportation. So it's kind of like, okay, if the government's spending a certain amount of money, and this is not me being, uh, not having a lack of empathy towards people who have real needs, who are struggling to make ends meet, who are working, who need to get to work, who have kids that they need to support. I absolutely empathize with them. And, you know, my wife and I support those people directly and indirectly through our own you know, volunteering and charitable giving. I don't want to do it in a forced way through the government. But what I'm saying is, if you're already pouring into public transportation saying this is to meet the needs of low-income people who have those needs, then focus on that. Don't say, oh, yeah, we're also going to pay to fix their cars. Like, there is a bus. There are trains. It is yeah. a big city. That, that does exist. And I do think it's we've kind of this is a problem that has been created for us in a, in a sense. You know, we are a very car heavy country. Sure. It, it's very like you and now, obviously, we don't live in a major metropolitan area like Columbus. But like you and I could not exist without a car where we live. We, we couldn't do anything. Right. Um, we could not exist without an internal combustion vehicle. <laughs> well, I think that's a different <laughs> thing. Yes. <laughs> very true. <laughs> but I. Uh, you know, it's almost like this is the solution to this problem is almost chicken and egg. If if the solution is a more connected space for those living in a metropolitan area, that takes a lot of money and time and investment. That doesn't fix the immediate problem because it takes time. So then things like this could help maybe if we had statistics and new, I don't know. But it's like it, I, I've been wrestling with this for a bit because it's kind of hard to, to digest. There's lots of different factors to consider some of them make me feel good and some of them don't but here's the other thing that kind of chaps my ass here too i'm sorry you had a good point but i'm just my no, mind is turning here i'm letting the, you think. i keep going back to the 3200 dollar <laughs> average repair bill right if people are like, like the, the amount of car you own should be scaled to how much money you make right there's no shame in any game Right. I'm not I don't want to look down on anybody because of what they make. But for if, if you're making 20 grand a year and you have a two thousand dollar car, it shouldn't cost five hundred dollars to replace a headlight. It should be a car that you can replace the headlight bulb or the taillight bulb for two dollars. 
Oh my god! When I first thought of this, I was like, "How are they spending sixteen hundred dollars on bulbs?" Right? Like, what's going on? <laughs> I know it's been a while since I bought a headlight, but but if 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 you're making twenty forty grand a year and you're leasing a car that's brand new and super expensive and has sealed beam headlights and LED tail lights, well, there there's your problem. Let's get them into a budgeting program or something that like you know give a man a fish he can eat for a day, give a man a fishing pole, teach a man how to fish, he can provide for himself the rest of his life. Like, let's solve the root problem and help people find a way out of where they're at. Because ultimately, welfare-type programs just enable the continuation of poverty. They don't actually get people to be self-sufficient and to succeed on their own, which is what we all want for our fellow man, is to see them succeed and to have independence. Um, yeah. I had another... Oh, I think the other point, too, is is the, the basis of this program ultimately was not to help people get to work. It isn't like, oh, man, your engine's on its way out. You need to get to work. It's, we don't want you to get stopped by police, so let's fix your taillight. Okay, well, just change the law then. Just make those non-violations. Well, I did think, too, that something else uh, I really like about this is I am all for reducing unnecessary police interaction, both for the I people think the and cops the police. Are too, yeah. yeah, everybody involved. If we just don't have to bother, but also Let's not stop sacrifice. Let's enforcing speeding then. That is an unnecessary well, <laughs> police interaction. So that's what I was going to, I'm coming around to that. <laughs> You know, if obviously while still keeping the roadways safe and making sure that somebody's derelict car is not affecting themselves or others and, you know, yada, yada, whole thing. But like, I'm all for reducing unnecessary police interaction. I would argue, though, that tires are more important to safety than headlights and taillights. The tires I see on the road, Doug, sometimes. (laughs) Absolutely. Tires and brakes should be number one and or rust holes. (laughs) Right. Like you're, you're only grip with the road is your four contact patches and unfortunately most you know low income people who are struggling to maintain their cars are not going to replace their tires unless they're broken and broken means popped but as car guys we know that broken tire really is like (laughs) if it's on the cords or if it you know is is worn out such that you don't have proper grip in the rain or emergency situations then that's that's dangerous to a lot of people when I, it's just for me that kind of goes back to we've just made a society requiring you to have a, a car in in all in making it very difficult to exist without one that it's we talked before with like the Ohio Institute potentially thinking about the app to help you learn how to drive and and everything is like driving is not necessarily something that should just be given to everyone. You should have to earn it because you're piloting a many thousand pound vehicle around the road that can kill people. Um, but at the same time, we need it to get places. So it's it's kind of flirting with that line. Right. Of like I, uh, it's required, but and you could have a terrible non-existent life without it. you could be on the street. You know, I don't know. But it's this is a very complicated topic. Yes, <laughs> I think. Yes. The long and short of it is, it's a great idea. Government shouldn't be doing it. And, you know, but you know what government could do well, right? We, we talk about like catalytic converter thieves. That's a major problem, major <laughs> economic impact. I feel like that's something the government could do well. Because if you wanted to fix the problem of catalytic converters being stolen, just put the EPA on it. Oh God, the EPA scares me and I'm not even right? in the business. If the EPA put half the effort into catching catalytic converter thieves as they do chasing dealers in shops that modify niche market cars they could make a real difference like a real difference (laughs) except they don't care because the victims of catalytic converter thievery are already required to bring their cars into compliance so they'll just they'll penalize the person double because well your cats got stolen but also now you're in violation of law so you have to pay to get new cats so they feel like they're saving the world because they're saving people from unnecessary carbon dioxide but you know the cats are so expensive yeah (laughs) it's depressing i have a diesel excursion that could do with a cat delete but if i do it i risk jail time but if i leave in a bad neighborhood you know somebody could just take them but i'd probably get in more trouble than they would and they're the thieves 
Oh yeah, because if you're driving around with a, even if somebody took it, you can probably still right. get cited or yeah. I you guess that doesn't need your knee exhaust. Check. No, I didn't. Yeah, so I don't know, but yeah, if 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 the government wanted car guys to get behind what they do, just redirect the EPA to something like that. Chase down catalytic converter thieves. Uh, anyway, on a lighter note, thank you for the three of you who are still here. <laughs> Our producer's rolling his eyes. Uh, Mustang Hearse. We found this picture on uh, Facebook this week, um, and it is exactly what you would think. This is the beauty of it. I don't really have to paint a picture for anyone. It was a Mustang Hearse. That's right, a Ford Mustang with a hearse body on it. I found oh. out I can do overlays on Boxcast, so I'm actually going to throw. I, I did some research. This wow! This so I'm actually going to throw up the photo here, so everyone can look. Oh at Oh my it with goodness, us. we are real techie. It's pretty tonight. big. Guys. All right, on, this so is, I'm excited. I, I texted That's the guys, good. and I'm like, all right, we there's there's this is ripe for some some good puns here. So we're going to have an a caption contest for this. And again, if you're watching still and you want to throw yours in, uh, there may be a reward for the best one. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll start it out with a really, really weak one. Uh, it, it probably really stinks in there. It smells, smells kind of musty. You could call it the musty ang. <laughs> I think they should call it the morgue stang. Ooh. That's, ooh, that's not good. Ford, I this. think Ford in this instance really stands for found on road dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I want to know if the, the coffin area that was constructed in the back is made out of the same garbage plastic as the rest of the interior. Like, is it just like <laughs> clattering down the road? <laughs> oh, man. I, it's the... Uh, I think the Mustang, this Mustang hearse, it's, it's like the automotive version of the Grim Reaper. But if you put like a super hot, like supercharged coyote motor in it, it could be the Grim Sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You know, it is kind of like a it, you kind of kill two birds with one stone. You take your Mustang to the car show and then you have a way to get people away from the car show. Oh, yeah. Crash and carry. <laughs> 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 Oh man! Y- you know what the uh, you know what the empty return trip from the cemetery is called? <laughs> oh, Deadheading it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, I-, I think we're beating a dead hearse horse <laughs> horse <laughs> horse. <laughs> yeah, the Mustang is a horse, not a hearse. There, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. <laughs> I want to know how they extended the wheelbase on this thing. Like it looks like somebody made like those. Uh, like those Cadillac flower cars that kind of look like El Caminos. Mm-hmm. They did that to a Mustang, but they just plonked a hearse top on top of it. <laughs> but it's like the really like basic black one, not this fancy stuff we've seen on some of the Japanese uh, hearses. I wonder what a fancy American hearse would look like. Cadillac. I think there was one. There was there was like a Cadillac DeVille or something like that with a big, the, the, the funky uh, Japanese temple on it. Uh, it was on uh we did this for the appraiser we did because there was the one that uh really kind of went for bonkers money on cars and bids and then there, that was the actual toyota century then there was a cadillac that was oh yeah it's a fleetwood there it is i see um yeah well anyway goodness yeah yikes <clears throat> but uh if if you uh want to make sure not to uh not to get hit by uh or be a customer involuntary customer of the mustang uh undertaker vehicle you know what they say hmm. don't look a drift hearse in the mouth <laughs> <laughs> asphalt serpent youtube chat says the undertake over <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> which i like quite a lot <laughs> Oh, I think it's commercial time. (laughs) Yes, and SwitchCast is brought to you by uh, Celebrity Machines. Celebrity Machines offers more than 250 different screen-accurate license plates as they've appeared in movies and TV shows, such as Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, The Fast and the Furious, Breaking Bad, and so many more. Celebrity Machines also makes our dealer insert plates as well as our commemorative 2539 plates from the fastest cannonball run ever. Visit CelebrityMachines.com for more info and use promo code SWITCHCAST to save 25.39% at checkout. I would say the fastest cannonball run ever until the Z06 guy posts his time. Oh, yes. 
Yes. We did have a VLM Chris in YouTube chat ask for the last eight of the VIN, uh, which I had provided. And it looks like uh, their theory is that it was a GM test mule. Uh, there's a couple of service records at GM service ops, mm. whatever that means. But that might explain why it's not on Carfax or That's anything. That's pretty cool. So either way, uh, somebody might have gotten a deal on that. Oh, uh, like, I'm sure. Oof. Mule hit a deer. Who won? <laughs> I, think, I think the mule did. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's do Scaminator. We haven't done that one in a while, yes. or at least not in our original format, which is where Tyler reads a listing, and I will yell or hit the drum or whatever when I oh, yeah. recognize that it's a scam. I'm so ready to be sad. Are if you ready to be sad? Why oh, do yeah, we have we to be sad? Oh, yeah, we don't know if this is a scam. I'm happy. Version. I love catching <laughs> scammers. <laughs> Alleged All right, scammers. This was posted on the Porsche 911 buy and sell group on Facebook. Hi, selling my grandfather's 1983 Porsche 911 Targa. Run and drives good. Nice car for its age. Garage kept all its life selling due to illness. Have a clean Florida title in hand. Serious buyers only. Asking price $42,500. Wait, that's the joke oh, thing. Yeah, I mean, that is a that's... joke, but that's... I wish it wasn't a joke, though. <laughs> that is quite low. That is really low. That it? Uh, yeah. I also mm. added punctuation, but there was this was just one long run-on <laughs> sentence. That's a tough one. Uh, there is obviously, anytime something is underpriced, it is a almost dead giveaway that it's a scam, but not always because... You know, the reason scammer scam is because there are lots of legitimate listings well underpriced. If there weren't, dealers wouldn't be in business. Um, the selling due to illness and grandfather thing is kind of the other dead giveaway. Again, these things can happen, but a common trick of scammers is that they will play on your emotions, your sense of empathy to get you to overlook other obvious grievances and i'm sure if you inquired about it they would t use their typical scammer language and it would be very apparent very quickly that it was a scam but um you know, there's a couple other things in the listing about the person that were you know obvious that it wasn't real but uh yeah that's underpriced selling for somebody else and playing off of of the uh the illness or something like that that's uh three for three on that one did you check out the comments on this at all no, I did not. Okay. I wonder if anybody was calling him out or if it was just oh, I mean, oh my God, yeah, no, you money people immediately. were calling him out. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I didn't pour through them. I, yeah, I yeah, that's peruse fine. them briefly. Uh, Wall of Shame this week is a fun one. Uh, somebody posted on Instagram. I'm not even going to identify him because I feel like he only did it for attention. He, she, whoever it was, um, said essentially to the effect of, um, responding to one of my listings on my account said, oh yeah, this guy goes on VinWiki to talk about shady slash, you know, scamming buyers and sellers and then turns out to be one himself. Womp womp. Yeah. So I responded and said, okay, uh, I don't know who you are. I don't think we've ever done business, but I will sit by the phone Monday at 11 a.m. Here's my phone number and wait for you to call me and complain about whatever transaction you had with us or why you posted this. Because if there's a problem, apparently I don't know about it, but you like trolling our Instagram page. Um, and guess what happened or didn't happen Monday at 11 a.m.? <laughs> That's right. No phone call. So I'm all about free speech. But when you needlessly and incorrectly, dishonestly troll my account on Instagram, you're going to get the ban. So he gone. He can never post again. And so. he's out of here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's do the question of the week. Yes. And question of the week is brought to you, as always, by Nuts for Sticks. Nuts for Sticks is a brand celebrating the manual transmission in all its forms. So forget those flappy paddles because we like shifting ourselves. Check out our fun and funny stick-themed shirts at NutsForSticks.com and save 10% on your order using the discount code SWITCHCAST. That is NutsForSticks.com and use code SWITCHCAST. 
Our question of the week is something that we brought up either last week or the week before. It was submitted to us through switchcast.live. And those of you that do not know, that is the website for all things Switchcast. You can get the latest updates, uh, latest podcasts, and submit a question to ask Doug uh, and me, maybe, but mostly Doug. That's He's the opinion we actually care about. Uh, so this one comes to the, us. a strong opinion. <laughs> This right one comes uh, to us from frequent YouTube chat uh, jo- uh, attendee, uh, Fanfic Rocks, uh, who asks, this is a long one, so buckle in, uh, is it possible to do an intercontinental cannonball run from the furthest eastern point in Ireland, or at least the easternmost town, to the furthest eastern town in the UK, to the fur- furthest eastern town or point in China or Japan, without going through conflict zones or areas the State Department has labeled a no-go? A major pathway to do this would be to follow a couple of continental highway systems for both Europe and Asia. Hmm. That would take forever. It would take a long time. I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that. Uh, I did a a little bit of searching, and and there was one in particular I wanted to highlight that has been done. It was a long time ago. So international conflict zones are, of course, always changing. So it depends what decade you ask this question. But... um, so I, I initially searched for your Asian race, which I did not get the expected results. I was thinking um, it was more about, you know, intermarital, you know, children oh, of my. Yeah, that's not what I would have expected at all. Right. But it makes sense now that uh, I look at yeah, it. Going, I oh, guess so. Yeah, the <laughs> Yikes. You're probably on a list now. <laughs> but uh, There's also lots of people who swim between Europe and Asia. That's a thing. Um, swim where? It's all connected. I don't know. There's some river, something oh, they, they okay. swim between. And yeah, I literally didn't care enough to read beyond that because I would never do it. But the the one article I wanted to highlight that um, I think is super interesting, and it sort of answers this question, but not really, really because it was 24 years ago. Uh, but there is a great story about these two gentlemen, Gary Sarby and Ken Langley, who were from Canada, and they took an old school Volvo wagon and they drove around the world. They set the Guinness world record for the fastest circumnavigation of the world by car. Took them three years to prep and only 74 days to finish. Whew. Yes. Of course, it's a Volvo 240, though. Yeah. (laughs) Things are indestructible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, anytime you do something like this, the rules are kind of like, okay, well, what counts? What doesn't count? Because you really don't actually hit every single place. You don't drive everywhere. You take ferries. You put your car on a plane. And the next person to do it might do it differently. And it might vary by like 1,000 or 2,000 miles or more. So... It's kind of a choose your own adventure thing. And I think that's the real answer to um, the the Europe, Asia, cross continental race. Um, it, it, the politics are always going to be changing. I don't think it's possible to to not run into potential roadblocks um, with you know, different countries and customs and stuff like that. Um, and heck, when you might leave, everything might be fine. And halfway through, <laughs> there's a war declared. Like, you just, yeah. you don't know. Um, so, but the cop-out answer is that half the fun of planning any sort of adventure like that, or, or half the fun of the adventure, half the fun of Cannonball is the planning itself. A lot of people want a recipe. Making the recipe up and figuring it out as you go is half the fun. Um, Christopher Michaels, another VinWiki guy, is one of the best people on the planet for planning crazy adventures like that. And another friend, John Fakara, was looking into doing... Um, so he had planned the 2904, which was a race from New York to San Francisco. It was about 2,904 miles. And he was going to do the 29400, which was a drive around the world. And it never came to fruition, partly because of the complexities of navigating the Asian part of this with all the different communist countries and customs and potential war zones and stuff like that. Like it just gets really, really risky. So that's a, that's a choose your own capital A adventure there. If you decide to embark upon upon it. Seriously. Yeah. I know at least the, the United States is one like whole thing. I know the States have their different laws and everything, but it's very different crossing borders. I mean, even on some of the old top gear trips, 
they show them trying to cross borders into other countries and it doesn't go very well sometimes. Right. <laughs> Especially with the whole TV crew and everything for them. So, uh, well, thank you very much for that question, Fanfig Rocks. Uh, Appreciate your continued and yes. loyal viewership. Let's go to the shrewd negotiator. Yes. Said it right. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> hey, there's a f- not a first time for everything, but uh, we're, we're struggling tonight. All righty. This Speak also, for yourself. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> well, you weren't before the podcast. Um, this also comes to us from the Porsche 911 Buy and Sell Group. Uh, there's a VIN that's the first thing listed, which while I appreciate it that it's there, I'm not going to read that to you. <laughs> 76,000 miles, clean title. Please note, wheels and custom exhaust is not included in the prices. What is it? Uh, the, What's the car? Oh, hey, I should read that first. <laughs> I had a whole... Yeah, who's struggling? Yeah, <laughs> me now. All right, this is a 2009... Tyler, everybody. <laughs> 2009 Porsche 911 Turbo for $87,500. Not bad. Uh, but yeah, wheels and custom exhaust not included in the price. Uh, however, for an additional cost, they can be included, which is usually how that works. Um, I'm also curious to see if they're going to take it off. Like, if the exhaust is on the car, are you going to pay somebody to swap it off for the stock one? I, you know, to that end, I had a friend who was buying, trying to buy a car from a dealer who shall remain nameless, uh, but he was a shrewd negotiator, was, is no more. Um, he was trying to buy a car, and the dealer wanted to charge my friend like $1,500 extra for this exhaust system for like installation or whatever to include it and my friend is like dude i'm looking at the underside photos you sent me it's already on the car <laughs> like you're gonna take it off if i don't pay you extra to leave it on Ooh. yeah yeah uh, he was he didn't buy the car all righty back to this uh this clean title porsche we got here uh this is <clears throat> i feel like i have to get my pompous voice out Introducing a meticulously maintained 2009 Porsche 911 Turbo boasting an impressive 650 bhp. This stunning vehicle has extensive service and repair records, leaving no expense spared, with total expenditure exceeding $58,000. The last 2009 Turbo model. Belonging to the Metzger Generation GT1 dry sump race engine is highly sought after and its rarity ensures consistent depreciation in value, making it an exceptional investment opportunity. Hold on a second. <laughs> Hold on. I, there if, it is. If I had the John Madden flag, whatever, the, you know, the, the football like, flag yeah. thing, I'd be throwing it right now. Flag on the play. Uh he said it's an exceptional investment opportunity with consistent appreciation. But the paragraph before, he said he had spent $58,000 in service. You are correct. That math doesn't math. Yeah, math ain't mathin'. He's uh, selling it for eighty-seven grand, and he spent fifty-eight grand in service. So he's selling it for $30,000. And I'm pretty sure this was a bit more expensive than that when it was new. Right. Or whenever this person bought it. Right. Uh, it is also a Tiptronic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that definitely not. <laughs> that does not guarantee consistent appreciation. And there's even more to the description. I'm not going to bother to read it. It's like from some uh, like promotional material, I swear, for this. But I swear to God, it is always the guys with the tips that have the fluffiest descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> because I think they're trying to distract you from the, what they're trying to buy. Right. It's like the salvage title guys, right? Like, yes. oh, it's super rare. Look at this spec salvage title. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and like, honestly, if a, if a Tiptronic is what you need or what you want, great. It's just not as valuable. Right. Not, or not as desirable, which means it's be. not as des- uh, yes. valuable. I, he started out well. He was talking about what he had put into the car. He was starting with specifics, but then he just had to go down the investment route. It is not a friggin' investment. It's a bad investment. <sighs> okay. Yikes. I right. apparently didn't do a good pompous voice because Devin Ruckus said that's movie narration voice, so I might be leaving Switchcast to get a career in trailer narration. I thought it was very good either way. <laughs> pompous enough. Trailer narration, it's it's one step above trailer park narration. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> no. <All> no? Right. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Now I'm getting fired by Ethan. No, he, he doesn't like mine. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. 
Uh, let's do the props and flops brought to you by Switch Cars, which will bring to a close the regularly recorded segment of our podcast. But for those of you still watching live after our uh, diatribe earlier on, um, <laughs> yes, if you haven't unsubscribed, canceled us, uh, stick around for live Q&A. We call it Tip Talk after the session. So props and flops brought to you by Switch Cars. And Switch Cars, as you know, is the enthusiast's dealership where we buy, sell, consign, service, and store only cars that we like ourselves. Check out our handpicked inventory at switchcars.com. And Doug, there is one choice for a pick of Switch Cars uh, inventory it's, it's this in week. Here. And if so you, you don't do it? this, <laughs> no, no, you do it. 1997 Porsche 993 with a 3.8 liter Patrick Motorsports built engine. It's got houndstooth center sport seats, uh, ocean blue metallic over beige interior. And that's right. The houndstooth is actually color matched to the exterior and interior interior oh. color combination. 996 sport seats, actually. And they're the hardback painted sport seats with ocean blue oh. metallic painted backs, roof steering wheel, Bilstein PSS nines, upgraded suspension. It is a beauty. It is a very mild, daily drivable outlaw, and it is hot. Oh, and it only has 35,000 oh. original miles. Doug, if I mention SwitchCast, do I get like 50% off? <laughs> is that how that works? No. <laughs> Darn it. You get a $1,000 discount when mentioning discount code SwitchCast. Oof. It is. So I've been drooling over it all night. <laughs> uh, we're going to do double flops and props of the week. Um the really quick flop and prop of the week. Flop of the week is Haggerty sort of kills the Detroit Concours. That's right. They b bought out the Detroit Concours a couple years ago and canceled it this year. It is no more. Um, we don't know why, but they said it's to make it better. Um, I don't know. I don't usually get divorced to make my marriage better, but, you know, whatever. And don't companies that declare bankruptcy usually say it's to increase efficiency and reorganize the team or well, whatever? Yeah, something like that. Well, Haggerty's doing just fine, but I don't know. Maybe they, they their growth at all costs model is coming at a cost. <laughs> uh, in other news, the Northville Concours, which is also in Detroit, uh, was started by a kid in high school, and it is doing just fine. In fact, it's thriving. So a kid in high school is beating a publicly traded company at executing the Detroit Concours. Well, I guess they executed. They <laughs> but, uh, need to get that Mustang back in here. here. Right. <laughs> Uh, prop of the week is to VinWiki, our favorite YouTube channel. They hit 2 million subscribers this week, so yay. I wish I had All a little right. air horn, like, bow, 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 bow. like mm. I don't know. <laughs> that or that. That'll do. <laughs> All, right. Uh, <laughs> All right, our flops and props bonus round here is yeah. I decided to do, what's that? So Yeah, that's exciting. I'm yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, you, what? Ethan is the very traumatized. excitement was not palpable. <laughs> after. Oh, people tell me that, but yeah, I'm pumped, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan was about to cancel the show in that political diatribe earlier, but... I didn't do anything. Look, I had to pull him away from the, the power cord though, this whole thing, so... <laughs> <laughs> it was about cars! It was about cars. I'm with you, man. Say what you gotta say. Let the people know. Listen, I, I don't fault anyone for disagreeing. This is, this is an opinion podcast. Absolutely. We're just here to, to chat and share opinions. So That's right. whatever. Um, okay, so flop of the week. We're going to share uh, some listener reviews, oh, props and flops. Some of the whoa. feedback we've received recently. I got a haircut, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. <laughs> My seven-year-old did not like it. <laughs> no. Got up this morning. Why'd you cut your hair like that again? <laughs> again. Just roasted. Again. Absolutely I didn't cut roasted. It. Your mom did. <laughs> your I'm not mom. I'm not, not my cool. wife. Your mom is <laughs> uh, all right. Quote. Doug hates Carvana, just FYI. We didn't even talk about them tonight. But this is from over the last month or so. But just so you know, I, I am going to swallow my pride. I am not going to respond to any of these. I'm just going to read them. Nice. I'm not going to defend myself. Uh, for those of you keeping track, the Carvana stock is down 10% in the last five days. Oh. Mm. Is it 10% from what? 
Well, it was at uh, 90, right, last week? Yeah, so it's at 82. Gotcha. Ish. Um, quote, the amount of falsity in everything you just said, absolutely mind-blowing. A scam? How? The hundreds and hundreds of cars on the road that have conversions would say otherwise. This is regarding EAG. I've followed EAG since the conception of the Scuderia. There are a few customers that had a bad experience as being blown up, then it's just so many that he went on for another two paragraphs. Whoa. Quote, you're just jealous that the Tesla minivan is faster than your Porsche for two thirds the money. There's a Tesla minivan. It's two thirds the money of a Porsche. Did I get to go into a coma? <laughs> oh, Doug's not responding. So Ethan, oh, you and I can right. just like, yeah. this is our show now. Right. Here we go. <laughs> you know, maybe that guy has a point now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> More of that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going off the rails. Sorry, sorry. That's good. Quote, I disagree, and I don't have the energy to discuss it. Oh, that's a, that's I a, feel that's like that's a good so comment, often. though. I like that. I like that. There's so many things in my life, I'm like, I disagree with that, but my God, I can't be bothered. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong, but... Eh. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, props of the week. Uh, the reviews are in. Here are some of the wonderful things our viewers have said recently, and we thank you. Quote, best car-focused podcast in the world. Oh, in the world. The world? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Somebody said that, and I didn't pay them to. We did it. And it wasn't mom. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> Um, and definitely wasn't Aaron because I don't think she would. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't hold that opinion. Uh, oh. Quote, love the shows, guys. You have made me a huge fan. I, pr I probably should stop binge eating while binge watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Look, snacks are essential. It's, it's only an hour. <laughs> Quote, listening to the Mexican Stig talking in circles about boomers, vets, and porchas is my new favorite <laughs> pastime. Love us a good porcha. Yeah. Quote, 2GD good for, no, oh, I got lost here. 2GD good of a show for this few comments. Come on, people, keep up the good. We we do have the good here. We got more yes. good coming at you. Oh, yeah. Stay Quote, tuned. wicked funny, wicked funny. I got to read it in the main <laughs> accent. Wicked <laughs> funny and good topics. I subbed like a tool, plus got to support a fellow Mena. Uh, that was good. Oh, yeah, we don't have the pine cones out tonight for that. I'm. Couldn't find them. Anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining us. Please stick around if you're watching live for Tip Talk. You can roast me. You can say whatever you want. You can ask questions, and we will answer. Thank you to my co-host and official supplier of banter, Tyler Sanders, our producer, Ethan Huffnagel, our sponsors, BoxCast, Nuts for Sticks, Switch Cards, Celebrity Machines, Parallel Printworks, and Stephen Holm Woodworking. Our bumper music is provided by Emily and Ivory. You can stream their full album on Spotify or SoundCloud. This episode will be available next Monday in audio format wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks at 8 p.m. as we look forward to edifying, educating, and entertaining you on the drive of your life. We made Ethan, it. Ethan, we got to pay a new peanut gallery. These guys are not cutting it. We made it, yeah. Better than it was last week. <laughs> That's true. Got one more set of hands. Well, I got to tell you, Doug, there was a lot of comments, not a lot of questions in YouTube chat tonight. <laughs> Ooh, there, was, yeah. there was lots of a stuff lot of happening. Uh, some right, folks bring it on. agree with you. Some folks don't agree with you. Okay. But there weren't specific things. They're just that was the sentiment. Uh, somebody I, did say. I agree and disagree with myself on a regular basis, too. Uh, so That they'd like to see the where is this? Uh, they vote for a Switch Cars Rebuilds channel. Which I think with your recent post of your 997 is we're getting close there. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Ferrari 456. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what's going on. It with wouldn't that. be a good channel. It would be, hey, Doug bought this janky car and he's paying somebody else to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go see where it's at. <laughs> oh. I just had this really good breakfast. Let's go check in on my mechanic. <laughs> we could call it like the Bougie Mistakes channel. <laughs> <laughs> bougie. Your mechanic is sitting there like in the fetal position, rocking back and forth. <laughs> don't make me do anymore. <laughs> I think it'd be good. Oh, no, I got grease on my driving gloves. <laughs> 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 uh.
There's a market for that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna be able to tap into tap into the two people in that market. Uh, <laughs> Cars and Coffee Bridgeport earlier. I think this person is going to hold us to the July 31st event. I don't I know if you were do. serious. Or I not. hope it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. bring it uh, fine. We're open house on July 31st. It's on. So uh, Cars and Coffee Bridgeport, you can come then to watch Swiss Ca- Switchcast live in person uh, and buy some merch because they'd love to buy a couple of shirts. Okay, so we got a merch use discount there. code Switchcast. I say you can get them now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh, the ads are over, Doug. It's actually cheaper to get it now online because if you come here you pay, pay sales full tax price <laughs> plus sales tax yeah uh th- this question's been asked twice okay um, i'll I, answer it twice i uh and it's um color combination on the 911 porsche uh, those do exist yes i i think are they, i think they might wait be let referring me answer it the, again yes <laughs> It's good. <laughs> Are they referring to the 993? Because if so, did did we say that? I think so. I said it was ocean blue metallic. It's beige interior. Okay. With some pretty hot hounds tooth. Yes. Can can you clarify? The 1997 the 993 Carrera 2 is finished in ocean blue metallic over beige interior with 996 sport seats with hounds tooth inserts and hounds tooth door panels. It's good. It's good. And it's got Tyler written on the license plate. It's really weird. <laughs> I don't know what we're... Oh, he's asking for the f- the first 911 Porsche. The first ever? I believe so. Do you know what the color combination I on it I think it was silver. It was that or I, I thought the know. first like 901 was red. Maybe the oldest one that exists now is the, red. The 901 convertible prototype was red. I don't know what the very first 901 color was. The first Porsche ever was silver. Hmm. The three fifty, yeah, uh, not the three fifty six. What the heck would they call that? Um, anyway, it was like a speedster kind of thing. Yeah, uh, VLM Chris just rocked in with a super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, who do you use to import cars from Europe? Didn't realize manual diesel E thirty eights existed. Uh, I use Silver Tiger Logistics out of Georgia. Um, they're pretty well they're on the more expensive side of things um because we they handle a lot more like high-end stuff with the air freight and the container shipping i think they will also do row row which is how you want to import cheap cars because it's cheap like nobody wants to pay 10 grand to container ship a five thousand dollar car from europe um but they're just they're very good at handling everything from start to finish making sure you're covered because there's a lot of unknowns and ways that you can miss and end up having to handle it, handle stuff on your own or get your car stuck in customs if you don't have the right people handling it. It's it's easy to do if you've done it before, but if you haven't, there's a lot of places that you can misstep. So Silver Tiger Logistics is my preferred importer. Yeah, I don't think I'd mind paying up for somebody that knows what they're doing to do that. Say I win the Powerball in a few hours. How much? I win the Powerball in a few hours. No, this guy. This guy wins the Powerball in a few hours. Okay. Oh, That's you were not what he wanted saying, me to say. That was like a Leslie Nielsen type joke. Good heavens. <laughs> Better than Leslie Nope type of joke. It's true. Say I win the Powerball in a uh, few hours. We just hours. went through this. Okay, right. Don't you... <laughs> Guys are struggling. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to read the question. Here's the gist of the question. Hypothetically, if this person wins the Powerball, is that good? I have so much more fun on TikTok. Way to work around it. Okay. I will say the majority of the hypothetically, how much of this guy's winnings are going to a driver spec 997.2 GT3? Got to be guards red and have carbon buckets though. 160 grand. I don't know what the Powerball is up to, so I can't give you a percentage, but 160 grand ish for a higher mileage one. Mm-hmm. You said driver spec, so that's a high mileage one. Driver spec, yes. Yeah, 180 to 200 if you want a low mileage one. Uh, Gumby on YouTube said, Hey, Doug, this is actually related. Look at the serendipity. Uh, what have been some of the highest private 997 GT3 sales, non RS? Well, if they're private, I don't think we can tell you. <laughs> Those are our secrets. Mm. That's, a, that's a very good question because I haven't been involved in the highest 
GT3 sales, and I think most of them have been public, to my knowledge. Uh, I have been involved in some of the highest RS sales. My estimate would be like 300 for the lowest mileage paint sample killer spec. I have to have this one for even um, for like an on RS. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of money. It is a lot. Whew. Well, there's that stupid one on bring a trailer that had mileage, but was paint to sample that sold for like 260 or something, which was so far of an outlier. I almost want to say it wasn't a real transaction, but I think it was. It just, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it's 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 probably up there. Eh, two fifty, I'd say probably two fifty. I I can't see a GT three selling for three hundred, so I I retract that statement. But anything's possible. Okay, um, hang on, I gotta. Jeez. Oh, okay, here we go. Here's a question. We got one on Instagram. But Hi, I gotta, Instagram. I gotta look at the phone over here to read it. Oh, because you can't move it. Yeah, hard knock life over here. Can you add like Jeopardy music for while you're trying to figure your stuff out? Yeah, over on. Too many cables over here. Uh, I, I was gonna, I was gonna note. let you go. Oh, <laughs> no, strategic I, I, stop. Yeah. Uh, dealer dock fees seem like a cash grab. Can you explain what Switch Cars dock fee includes? Every dealer I've been to charges hundreds of dollars, and the title reg. Are never part of that. Sure. Uh, we charge two hundred fifty dollars. That includes a forty-five day temporary registration. It includes a mandatory Ohio title transfer. That does not include anything for out-of-state buyers because we don't do that for out-of-state buyers. Uh, it does include registration if buyers so choose within the state of Ohio. Um, so everything is done for. Uh, buyers within Ohio, uh, but it just also covers other costs that um, are part of the transaction that essentially it's protecting our administrative costs, right? Because everybody wants to, I feel like if buyers didn't negotiate, then dock fees wouldn't be necessary, but because d buyers are always trying to negotiate down to the last penny, the dock fee is like, okay, we have to UPS stuff in and out for titles. We got wire transfer fees. We have, you know, whatever fees go along with all of the crap that happens. We do our own titles in-house. We do pay a title clerk, so that is a cost. But some dealers pay a title service, so it actually costs them money to, to process that stuff. Um, but we keep it to a reasonable and measly $250. Um Two thousand dollars that some dealers in Florida charge, yeah, that's just that's just padding their pockets. That's friggin' ridiculous. Uh, okay, business wise here, this is good. Get to speak into the next generation of entrepreneurs. Doug, what advice would you have for a beginner car flipper with no dealer's license when it comes to scaling, scaling their business? Get a dealer's license. That's a good starting point. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> uh, scaling is the same with, it's the same principle in any business, whether you're trying to franchise a Chick-fil-A or sell 10 cars instead of one, is you have to build a box and make the box work and before you build more boxes. So, you have to make money on one or two cars. If you don't make money on the first two or three cars, other than, oh, I recognize what I did wrong and I fix it and now I'm making money. But if you can't make money on, let's say, five or ten cars, then you're not going to make money on 100 cars. Selling more doesn't fix it. So figure out how well you're doing and then um, essentially find a niche, right? So find what you're good at. Find what you know and determine where there's a market demand or um, kind of a gap in the market to where you can actually get in and provide value and buy cars for less and sell them for more because it's insanely competitive. For every car that's out there that's 5% or 10% under market value, there's 100 dealers that all want to buy that car. So you have to figure out where you're providing value or where your source of cars is or something like that. Because a lot of times 
it's very difficult to scale just because as soon as you try to do more, you run into competition. Like, okay, I can find one or two cars a month here on Marketplace, but I can't find 20 just because there aren't 20 deals. So that's where getting a dealer's license and saying, okay, I'm going to either go to the auction or develop wholesale relationships with dealers or find some other source to buy cars comes into play because you can't sell cars if you don't have cars to sell. So the buying is is the uh, the important part of that. So, yeah, figure out where there's a market, figure out what you're good at, where there's money to be made, and figure out how you can buy cars for less than they're worth. Uh, Great. Okay. Yeah. Are you, are you wrapping it up? There's. I don't know. Is there any? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if Doug ever sold, this is you. Yeah. If Doug ever sold the rare C5, what would be the next Corvette or American sports car that he would buy? Uh, it's a secret. There is one Corvette in particular, a very special one that I've been trying to buy for like six or seven years. Um, and yeah, I don't want anyone to know what it is because I don't want them to beat me to it or pay more than I will, which probably lots of people will. But uh, I would certainly sell Gretchen for that one if I ever can get it. Uh, the peanut gallery said all Corvettes are special, Doug, so you're going to have to be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> My Corvette is best Corvette. Oh, there he is. Oh, hey, Mark Corvette is best Corvette. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>